I'm Martin Hatchwell. I am a horticulturist and a writer, and at one time I was a tour guide. I came to Neisner first in 1964 for a family holiday, and then returned in 1983 to live here, at which time I would have been 25 years old. And the family that I joined living here uh, was uh, quite a forward-thinking family, I think, because the old man, Mike Goldberg, um, bought a houseboating business here and he went on uh, together with William Smith who uh, used to own Featherbed Nature Reserve he went on to to establish the Featherbed Nature Reserve Tours uh, which Featherbed is now the biggest um, uh, commercial attraction in the Garden Red. And when we started uh, I was with William and Mike and a couple of other people including the um, the uh, uh, port captain of, of Mossel Bay, I can't remember the man's name. And we went and walked the tour, uh, 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 we walked the path at Featherbed Nature Reserve together. Uh, my dog was with us. <laughs> In those days you could do that sort of thing. So that was long before it became, a, it became a, a commercial attraction. And at the end of that walk they turned around to me and they said, okay, now you go and research it and you, and you create a tour. Um, which is still the basis of the tours that they that they are, are the guides are using today, um, and I think we took the first guests at Featherbed Nature Reserve in 1984, or maybe or maybe a year out. It might be 1985. But um, when we started, we used to take everything across the uh, the water. Um, uh, the kitchen staff used to drive around with the, with all the picnic stuff and with everything to eat, and I used to drive the boat full of passengers across to the reserve over the lagoon um, and then we would take them up to the top of the of the western head by by vehicle um, and I'd walk them down again and uh, by the time we got back to the the campsite the the, the lunch would have been set up and uh, everybody had lunch and we, we brought them back and when we started for the Reserve, reserve we could uh, we had a capacity for 45 people per tour and we used to think we were really doing well if we had maybe three tours a week. Now they have three, four, five tours a day. And uh, they have over 100 people on, on a full tour. So it's really grown um, remarkably uh, in, in all those years. And I remained associated with it for uh, probably the first five years. Um, uh, I was the tour guide there up and down that mountain every day. And I was the only tour guide there for many years. Um, then other people joined us and, and I moved on to other things. And I continued in tourism, but when I moved over to, to, to communicating about tourism, I became a, a, a writer and PRO about, um, for the tourism industry. And um, I used to visit Featherbed on occasion because I was uh, friendly with the previous owners. And, and uh, then, I sort of developed a public relations business and by the time the 2017 fires came along, unfortunately because of personal things that happened, uh, my business, my business uh, was, was not doing very well. So then the fires uh, completely, I mean, I just stopped getting work altogether. And almost at the same time, uh, just in fact it was in December 2017, they phoned me from Featherbed and the, the managers and they said look no one knows to feather bed like you do you're a qualified horticulturist please come back and help us rehabilitate the forest and fame boss at feather bed which is what i did i'm there on a part-time basis now i've been there since uh, december 2017 and it, it's it's been an incredible honor to have been uh, one of only two people who helped to build the place and is now helping to rebuild it the other being a man called samson and gala who who works as the as the foreman there and was the foreman there when when, when we started? Um, we were uh, we, we, so we, we're working together now with a team of, of fourteen men who um, have helped us to remove the invasive alien um, uh, vegetation and to re-establish the the famous and the forest which was destroyed by the fire. Um, so yeah, that's been an enormous privilege. And um, while all this has been going on. I've had the um, 
the other privilege of, of, of having developed a, a, a website that I'm incredibly proud of, which is neisnermuseums.co.za, um, which covers the Neisner Municipal Museum. The website was developed for the municipality. Um, and the mu Municipal Museum has five buildings, the Pitt Street House, uh, the M uh, Parks Cottage, Parks Shop, and the Millwood House, all of which are in, uh, in, on the one campus lower down on Queen Street, and then up, further up on Queen Street is the old jail. And the museum also covers uh, the non-municipal um, uh, museums, like the Sand Parks uh, Living Legends Museum out at uh, Ipvala, where they've got the, uh, the skeleton of the elephant, and, and various other um, forest, interesting forest things. And uh, the other museums are the Motorcycle Room, which is the private collection of motorcycles down on Tyson Islands, the uh, uh, Ian Fleming uh, photographic collection, and the uh, one museum that I think people tend to forget about, which, which I really love, which is the little NSRI museum on Tyson Islands, where the, um, the, the rescue boat Alex Blakey is, is dry docked. So those museums are all on the on the website as well as and also there are um, the Neisner Art Society and, and the Neisner Historical Society and there's a piece or a page on the site about the um, uh, the fort on Fedorm's Court which is up behind the private hospital. It was a fort that was built during the South African War to protect Neisner in case of uh, of invasion by the Boers. Um, it's, it, the, the fort is still there and, and uh, the, the upper town um, neighbourhood watch is hoping one day to restore it. I hope they do too. Um, so, so I've uh, worked on, on various projects for the website. Um, the most recent was uh, on the, in the park's shop, uh, under the park's shop page, there is a series of eight links to, to further pages which, is, which explore the timber economy uh, of, of the timber heritage of Neisner, which is, to me is, th there are two things that, that really make Neisner Neisner to me, and the one is obviously the lagoon, or more, fish, more, more correctly probably the estuary, that's what the uh, environmentalists want you to call it, and the other is, is the timber, and um, I'm of the opinion that, that the timber has been neglected in the last 15 years or so, both as an economy and as our heritage. So it was, a, it, it was again another huge privilege and one that I really enjoyed. I, I put together a series of eight posters uh, for the museum, which will be or have been displayed in the park shop um, on the timber heritage. So the, the woodcutters, the, the timber merchants, the, um, uh, the, uh, the kind of wood that they cut um, the little old um, um, coffee pot railway, which was the railway that went from the harbour down on Tyson Islands up to Deep Walls. Um, and I, I was lucky enough even to find um, original footage on, on YouTube of that uh, railway, so which I was able to embed on the website. So we did these eight posters. Uh, I did it together with a designer by the name of Joe Hugo, um, using a lot of historical photographs, and each poster has only a hundred words of text on, on, that, on that particular theme. But at the bottom of each poster, there's a QR code, which if you scan that QR code, takes you to the page on the website. So it's kind of digital to history interface, which is uh, uh, a nice way of, of really bringing the whole thing, the heritage out to, to, to everybody, whoever wants to look at it up anywhere in the world. And um, we are now, working towards a second series of, of posters which will be which will cover the gold mining history of Nasna and uh, and the the local archaeology um, uh, the, especially the, the middle stone age archaeology that, that's being studied in this area um, the, the the gold the gold mining is quite an interesting one because it was the first modern era um, gold rush in, in South Africa. Um, uh, gold was found here uh, long before it was found on, on the reef. I mean, I'm talking decades. Um, and then, I think 10 years or so before it was found on the reef, they, they started uh, 
they started digging here, uh, prospecting. It wasn't a very successful thing, it was 600 and something ounces of gold was taken out in total and then it was basically it was worked out. Um, the, I mean, the, you know, the gold reefs were worked out. But, uh, but it's a lack of story, a nice, interesting story. And it, it um, weaves in nicely with, with the, with the um, very famous novels, of course, from Dolly and Mattia of the forest, which I think nobody has uh, done the forest quite so much uh, honour as, as she did with her, with her books. And uh, um, her, 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 her forest novels were very important in my development of, of my enjoyment of Meisner because um, she really touched the core, I think, of Meisner. And talking about that, um, I have, along the way, met the most incredibly interesting people right across the board. And um, it's a personal opinion, but one of my sad things of Neisner is the, uh, the closure of the, of the timber factory on Tyson Island and the development of that um, residential area. I know too many, well, I've met too many people along the way who lost their jobs and were never re-employed um, uh, at, at that factory. And, um, 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 you know, we were all promised that so many jobs would be created by the development and all that sort of thing. But they don't last. Those jobs, the developments come and go and the people get left behind. And I've met so many people, I've given people lifts and that sort of thing, and I've asked them about their story because... I'm a writer, I like to hear people's stories. And there's a lot of... I'm sad because a lot of those people lost their jobs and the economy, as I understand it, the economy transferred from a mixed economy, which is what it was when I arrived here. There was farming, there was, uh, there was uh, plantation forestry, there was conservation forestry, um, there was a certain amount of manufacture and although the population was a lot smaller, I don't remember meeting unemployed people. It developed into a development economy, which I think was a fatal mistake. Because when development comes to an end, where do you go next? And I think that's why Nisla finds itself in the position that it finds itself in now, which is a, um, I don't want to call it a failing economy, but I, I don't know what else to call it. Because... The builders have gone. We've got this little, um, you know, bump from from the fire. Well, it's not an insignificant bump. I mean, seven or seven or eight hundred houses were lost in the formal economy, in the formal houses, and 150 houses in the informal settlements. Um, so those have to be rebuilt. So there's a little bit of a research after the um, after the fires, and I'm personally benefiting from that as well because I've gone back to feel the better work on it. But when those people's houses have been finished, which will happen in the next few months. What happens next? That's why I'm so interested in the timber economy, because I think that that is where our, our future could, could go. Um, the other thing that I've, I, I really think needs to be, the story that I think needs to be told is, is the, I don't think anybody really understands the, the forced removals that happened here in Nisner. Everybody was taken from Salt River and dumped at Hornley, basically. Um, and there was a whole community at Salt River. The, um, uh, the outstanding person of that community, of course, was um, Percy Madala, after whom the Percy Madala High School has been named. Uh, he came down to this area from the Eastern Cape um, his name, his story is told on the uh, Nisner Museum's website. Um, he came down from the Eastern Cape. He came to the attention of uh, the, one of the local churchmen who um, he, he originally employed um, Percy as, a, as, a, as a, a gardener. And when he discovered he was a qualified teacher, he asked him to go and teach at St. Paul's Caradoc in Salt River, which was a... Um, a, a non-government school, got no, it got no government uh, uh, funding originally. And the irony is just before the people were moved out of Salt River, the government finally had decided to give it some funding. But um, it, there, there was a Jewish couple whose name escapes me, who funded it to a certain extent. And he was like, 
he was like the children's version of St. Francis of Assisi, as far as I'm concerned. Because St. Paul's Caradoc was situated on the opposite side of the river. In other words, on, as far as I understand it, on the eastern side of the river, Salt River. And most of the people's houses were on the western side. And when the river rose, the kids just didn't come to school. Percy Madala used to go down and he used to physically carry those children across the, the, the river into the school grounds at the beginning of the day and then take them back at the end of the day so that they could get to school. He, he uh, instituted a, a, a program of, of, of Hespasuk, I don't even know how else to put it, where he would go and visit people, uh, visit, visit the, 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 the parents and say, uh, you know, this is why you should have your child educated, this is why you should send your child, children to school. I've met people who knew him um, when I, they, those people are still around in Nice now, I don't know, unfortunately, their names and, and any longer, but, but th that whole story of uh, that, I mean, he's what a, what a magnificent man, and um, what a tragic story in, in, altogether. Um, um, and I think Neisner, and I, I kind of probably going to be my last point, if you look at all these things, the, the changes in the economy, the, the, um, the, the slide down the path, if you want to put it that way, um, the forced removals, the consequences for the people who were removed and, and for the white community, which I, I think were equally damaged um, by, the, by the results of, of the whole apart, I think. Neisner is, is, it's like a, um, a microcosm of South Africa, which is why it's such a fascinating place. Uh, flight, flight, my studio site.